Hello, everybody. Hope you're all out there. Welcome again. Just getting myself all organized. I'm coming to you live from Adam HQ today. Uh, thought we'd change it up. I thought the resolution wasn't so great last week on the video stream. So let me know, actually, if, I, if you feel like it's any better this week. Um, give, me a, give me a shout in the chat. Are you there? How are you doing? How's life? Let me know. Um, so today, let me just get my my uh, my PowerPoint ready. Etienne is back in action. Hello. Hey, Nire, what's up? Nice to see you back again. Okay, so let's, hey, Christopher. Hey, Travis. Cool. Much, looking much more foxy. All right. Travis, nice. Okay, so um, <laughs> so let's get going. We've got a really, we've got a pretty massive uh, webinar today. Potentially, any of my students that are, that are out there know the kind of person that I am. Is that I uh, I like to pack in a lot of information. So um, I have tried to do that today, but also we might find that it's too much, and we'll figure it out anyway. But what I wanted to do today, um, well, first of all. I should, before we dive in, anyone who wasn't there last week, hello. Um, my name is Jane. You can see information about me there. I'm uh, bringing these webinars to you with care of Adam Audio because I'm the product specialist here. Um, I'm also a producer, a mixer, and a composer like all of you lovely people out there. And um, I'm also a lecturer at BIM Berlin. Any BIMers, what's up? How are you doing? Um, so, okay, so we are at part two of our three-part webinar series. Um, we did set up some workflows last week. It was really great fun, really awesome participation and feedback, and really, really, I enjoyed it a lot, and um, I think you all did too, so it's really great to see those of you back. Um, today we're doing audio processing, and then next week the plan is to do vocal production and mixing, where we kind of we are going to bring the, the parts one and two kind of together when we focus on vocals next week. Um, so uh, today, as I, as I was just saying before, today we're doing um, audio processing, which is, I guess, what people think of as what mixing is, right? It's the actual doing and the shaping sounds and all that kind of stuff using different types of audio processes. So the ones that we use the most, excuse me, is EQ and compression. They're our two, the, the big two, I call them. Um, and there, it's really important to fully understand and master EQ, equalization and compression if you want to be a good mix engineer. Um, it's very important. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time on that today. And then we're also going to talk about spatial and dimension processing. I'm getting a little bit esoteric with spatial and dimension processing because I think it is, you know, again, if you, can, if you can remember from last week, I'm kind of interested for you to think about sound and think about your approaches. So we're going to have a look at that a little bit as well. Um, so we had some questions from last week, and I, I reviewed the, the the video, the webinar, and um, I just want to check in. There are a few things I didn't answer. So um, the questions that kind of came up that I didn't answer, but I am going to be looking at this week, or today, should I say, is routing and parallel tracks and how the parallel tracks relate to my routing flow. Um, we're going to look into the spatial concept. There's this 3-2 approach. I do something kind of similar, maybe slightly different. So we're going to look at that. Um, we're definitely also going to talk about maintaining unity whilst audio processing, which we kind of looked, I introduced that concept last week. And um, we'll also talk a little bit about arrangement and how it how arrangement impacts mixing and how mixing can help you improve if issues if you find them when you're mixing, if that happens. There were two other big questions. One of them was to talk about browserizing, and I'm sorry whoever asked that, but I'm not going to have time to do it in this webinar. I will try to do it next week, um, but also I might not. If uh, I don't have time to do it, I will give you some links to sources so you can check it out yourself. There's lots of stuff online as well about it. And also, I didn't really talk about setting up references. I'm going to do that next week, okay? So let me just... Uh, Hang on, a few more things, a few more kind of organization before I'm going to give you your first interactive question, so stand by. But just to give you a sense of what is about to happen today, we're talking about EQ compression and spatial, as I just said, and we're EQ first, where I'm going to give you a basic primer, 
um, ask you some questions about EQ. Then we're going to think about, okay, how do we compute? EQ in the context of a mix, and then I'm going to throw you out a few tips, hopefully some new stuff. Um, then the same kind of thing with compression. I want to test you about if you really understand what compression is. We're going to look inside a few kind of common approaches to compression in a mix, and then I'm going to give you some tips. And then, as I said, spatial will go a little bit woo with with uh, spatial and dimension <laughs> processing, and I'll kind of bring it in to give you some practical tips at the end. Okay, so that's where we're headed. So let's get started. And your first question to kind of get everything happening out there. I have to check in on the chat in a second to see where you're at. But first question for you, what comes first? Is it EQ or compression? What comes first in your insert chain? <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to give anything away. And I'll be interested to, to see and hear your responses. OK, so I'm going to check in on that in a second. Maybe I'll just do a quick check in and see where we're at. Ollie's back. Hey, Ollie. David, how's it going? Caroline Ty. Hello. All right. Okay. So let's see your answers to what comes first, EQ or compression. Okay. I'm going to come, come back into them. And also, as Anna just said in the chat, any questions that you have, just put them in um, in the chat at any time throughout the Q&A. And Anna is on hand. He's, he's lurking in the background and he's keeping an eye on all of the questions and he's going to um, send them to me so I don't miss miss out on them. So I have points in the webinar where I'm going to come back to it, okay? So, um, yeah, so let's see. Okay, so where are your answers? I have no idea, says, says Travis. What comes first, EQ or compression? <laughs> come on out there. Let's, okay, here we go. Jill saying usually EQ before compression. Johans reckons it's EQ. In disguise, it depends what you want to achieve. Cool, all right, nice stuff. So I'm not going to give you the answer to that question just yet. You can just all think about it for a bit longer. Okay, so let's get into it. So EQ is up first. And as I said, basic primer, how to use EQ in mixing, and then some tips. So let's get into the EQ primer first. So as from last week, I'm going to be throwing you some questions. So the main question I think is really important is for you to ask yourself and for me to ask you as students or whatever, how do you know that you're making the right EQ cuts and boosts? How do you know? The answer that I've put here is research, training, and then practice or experiment. So that's how you get to know the right answer. But the answer that you would, you know, if you ask me or if you ask, you know, Andrew Sheps or someone like that, is that they can hear it. They just know. They trust their ears and they trust their the wealth of experience that they have behind them to make the choices and to, to craft the sound that they hear in their head, right? And that's the thing is what's the link between something you hear, something you want in your head that you can actually achieve it in real life? And that's the same with mixing or with playing guitar or whatever, okay? So, again, I'm here to help you get to that place yourself. So the answer is research, training, and practice and experimentation. So research, what does that mean? Well, I've put up a few of my favorite books. Hopefully you have heard of these. If you haven't, maybe there's a couple of new ones there. The Mix Engineer's Handbook is such a great Bible. It's a really good companion when you're learning to mix. And if you're feeling unsure, particularly of things like EQ, this is going to really, really help you. So anyone who has never read that book, get it now and use it, buy it, print it out, have it next to you, have it on your iPad. It's a really great companion. Um, my next hot tip is um, Zen and the Art of Mixing. That's one of my favorite books. It, it gets into the the approach, the mental approach, um, and I really it's it's invaluable. Behind the Glass gets uh, producers talking specifically about their projects, so you can really get into the into the vibe of different producers. So please check those out. They're super important when you're starting off. Um, the kinds of things that you'll see in it are things like this slide. Now maybe I'm going to go into the different. Um, different view here. Where am I? Let's go big. Uh, yeah, cool. All right. Um, right. Okay. So hopefully you can see that a little bit better. So some of you, maybe all of you have seen this before. Some of you might not have, but I think it's a, these kinds of, there's lots of them online as well, right? So these kinds of things are really great to help you. And I'm going to give you a specific, I'm going to walk through a specific way of how to, how to use a chart exactly like this in a minute. Okay, so research, learn, read, figure out information um, from people who know better. 
The second thing is to develop your skills, which means your ears and you, the way your critical ear. And that is a question that I was sent um, in preparation for the session today. So great minds think alike. Whoever asked that question, here's the answer to it. Um, uh, for skill development, there's so many really great ear training apps out there. Um, Train Your Ears is a software application that you use with your computer. Sound Gym is an online uh, ear training application, which is kind of fun. Quiz Tones is really good as well. Um, my favorite is actually called Frequency. Any of my students will have uh, experienced Frequency uh, in, in my classes. And it just starts as a simple sign tone and it goes boo. And then you say, oh, what frequency is that? Boo. What frequency is that? Does anyone want to throw it, throw it in? It's about mid mid frequency, 400, 500. Anyway, find out. Um, so that one's really good. And then you can progress from sine tones. Once you get into sine tones in frequency bands, you can start to move into noise, filtered noise, and then you can start to apply cuts and boosts, like Train Your Ears um, does like EQ cuts and boosts to different tracks that you can experiment with, okay? So please ch check those out. Um, and a question for people, if you haven't put it in already, please put in the chat, um, what are your favourite books? Have I have I hit on one of your favourite books already? Um, have you got any other ones that I haven't recommended? And what about ear training? How Have you got any other apps out there that I haven't, that I haven't brought out? So let's, uh, let's share information. Anyone got any ideas there? Let's see. I'll check back in in a sec. Okay, so the final thing, and I promise I'm going to get into doing EQ in a second, but I really wanted to get this stuff right, um, to talk about this first up, is practice. Okay, and I want to talk about the concept of practice because I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding out there. So there's this thing called 10,000 hours. Some of you have heard of it, probably. All of you, let me know if you've heard of it. So the idea about 10,000 hours was by this psychologist in the 90s or something, and he said, he analyzed experts like violinists and tennis players and he said that uh, averaging 10,000 hours get gives you mastery but it's actually much more complicated than that because you know life you know people we come from you know diverse kind of uh, experience and background but in addition to that it's also about the way that we apply our uh, our energy when we're practicing so I, I think that the 10,000 hours is quite important in a context of mix engineering because you really have to sit or stand if you're a standing mix engineer but you have to do the hours you've got to get as many mixes under your belt as possible like mix and do it and experiment practice and each time you do it you're developing your ears you're learning more about the equipment that you're using and you're you know you have more to, to pull from so I think time is important but the other side of it is if you go in and you just do the same thing every week, you're not going to really progress very far. So I put here in pink important aspects that you need to bring into your practice. One is a growth mindset. And that means that you want to challenge yourself, that you want you don't think you know everything and you are willing to hear and try out other people's ideas in order to make yourself better and you're interested to research other people's ideas. The second one is critical engagement. So this is things like having references in your mix um, and so that you're checking in, am I doing the job that I think I want to be doing, okay? So critically analysing your work. Um, also experiment, the idea and the, the playfulness to try things out. I think quite often we feel really stressed out that we have to be brilliant already and we don't leave enough time for play and experimentation and that's what's going to make you really special if you experiment and find your own flow like that's everything right so don't forget to enjoy and have fun and you know just freak out every now and then and of course through all of these things it's about creating good habits and if I go back to last week I think knock iron asked a question about how to set up the mix template and it's like just make a decision and certain rote types of things like this do them the same way every time get a good workflow, get a good, you know, the way that you work, have two hours on and 30 minutes off or whatever, okay, and create a good uh, balanced approach and kind of methodical and professional approach to it. All right. So that they're my three. And I, again, it's a bit geeky and it's a bit teachery, but I think it's very important. Nice one. And all, so do you, because you're all studying. So nice one. <laughs> Let's check in if they see if there's any questions. Um, David says, let me, I'll put this one up. 
David says, can't see it now. Um, Studio is, is a nice app. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's a good one. Um, what else here? I've got some really nice chat going on. Cool. Oh, metal heads. Nice one, Etienne. Um, metal music manual by Mike Manet. Manet? Manet? Yep. Cool. That's a good one. That's actually a really good one to have. Um, and also Nokine's bringing in deliberate practice. So that's more in, in general a discussion about how to approach your work. Cool. This is great. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Nice one. Nice one. All right. So let's get back to it. So now if, we, if we're going to, um, we've got our 10,000 10, 10, hours or something approaching to that. So how are we approaching it? So back to that question, how can you know how to make the right EQ cuts and boosts? Here is how. Okay. So this is my, I don't know if you can see that properly. Hopefully you can, but I'm going to go through it with you. Please don't use presets. If you want to learn, don't use presets unless you're analyzing and deconstructing the preset, then yeah, it's okay. So I'm not saying never use presets. I'm just saying in the context of learning, don't use presets because they just make decisions for you. And then you think you're brilliant because you like did something, but you didn't do anything. That's a little secret. You didn't do anything. Okay. So what we are going to do though, is we're going to, first of all, analyze the sound in question. So, and what I mean here is to try and use a specific adjective to describe the sound. So it's either going to be the problem in the sound that you want to solve, or it's going to be the feature of the sound that you want to bring out. A few examples. The kick sounds too clicky. The vocal sound uh, too piercing. The bass um, I want to bring out the the grit of the bass. The I want to bring out the sub aspects of the kick drum. You get where I'm going with that, okay? So being specific, adjectives relating to the sound, and it can be relating to pitch or it could be a texture, you know, gritty, all of these kinds of words. But trying to be specific about it is quite important, I think. So once you've got that, then we go into our research, which we're looking at like this, and we try and apply the the adjective or whatever and find something similar in this to help us right so this is again you're doing this when you don't know the answer if you know that sub relates to 45 to 60 hertz knock yourself out go and do it straight away okay but this is when this is for the times when you when you're not sure okay cool. I think you get where i'm headed with that so then we fig figure this out get the frequency relating to the sound. So let's say, for example, I'm going to do this one in a second. You want to bring out the knock in the either an 808 bass line or a kick drum, okay? So does anyone know, before I give you the answer, what is the frequency if you want it for the knock frequency, the that knock frequency, which is a really big thing for anyone who, who's the hip-hop trap producers out there and mix engineers. You should know that. Okay, so um, then we're going to go get an EQ, uh, get a filter, a notch filter, and I would probably boost it first. You want to hear, is that the sound that I was hearing? Is that what I want? Um, cool, you find it, you go, yeah, that's it. Or you go, mm, it's not quite. And then maybe you'll do a little sweep around to try and figure it out, get the nice frequency, drop it out. Okay? So let's have a little, let's have a go at it now. Okay, demo time. In Disguise says 1K maybe for the knock. All right. Any other further advances on 1K? I'd be interested. Around 3K, says Chris. All right. I'll just take, hang on, I'm going to take off knock on thing there. Any, any, anyone else willing to take a bet? Check it out. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go back. Let's go to my track now. Um, Pro Tools. I'm using a weird mouse today, so I'm sorry. It's a little bit slow. It's quite frustrating. Um, here's my track. Hopefully it won't be too loud. Be careful just in case. I think it's fine. We started on Sunday. Day and a half, one more and all. Hopefully yearning. Careful the stories to be. 
Okay, so this is a track from last week that you heard, so I'm still working on this one. Um, and I've worked on it a little bit because I wanted to get some stuff prepared for you for today, but it's still very much a work in progress. So let's check it out. So what I wanted to, to, to demonstrate was that last thing about EQ. So let's try it. So I've got my uh, bass. And let's solo it. I think I actually still got the effects turned on. Yeah, I do. Okay. So here's my kick drum. Now, I'm going to do this separate from the mix, but I normally would do this in context of other sounds because otherwise it's pointless, right? Right. So now the first thing that I wanted to do is to let's say we're going to bring out the knock frequency so it's a mid frequency so whoever said 1k in disguise you're in the ballpark it's a little bit lower though it's a it's like kind of 600 to 800 generally more yes yeah, 600 ish so let's see um i've got meq now this anyone who wants to this is a very famous emulation of pull take eq um, this is a Pro Tools one, there's a Waves one, there's lots of them. So um, I'm using different kinds of EQs today just to check out, just to give you, you know, a bit of a chat about where it's all at. Okay, so in this instance, let's see where we're at. Now, this is really funny because you said 1K and I said less, but I obviously when I was mixing this, I had it at 700, but I thought it didn't cut through enough, so I changed it. So let's go to 700. knock now it actually is better at 700 by itself but let's now hear it in the mix all right loopy ah it's new mice mouse hate it okay let's check it now I'm going to actually, I'm going to mute um, the vocals and the synth and because I just want to hear this in relation to the drums. So I'm going to knock up that. Oh, this mouse killing me. Okay, try again. All right. Now I'm turning the compression on, let it cut through a bit more. Off. On. You can really, hopefully you can really hear the, the difference there. It's really cutting through. Now if I change it to, I'm going to leave it at 700. I think I prefer 700. I don't know how it happened there. So that's quite a significant boost that I'm doing to there. So that is an example of thinking about the frequency, knowing what I'm going to do, and then applying it, okay? Um, another example, let's do one more, where I have, um, so I have a kick drum here. I'm going to turn all this stuff off, um, and let's just solo it. Okay, so this kick, and when I'm analyzing this kick, it is recorded live with little to no compression by the sounds of it. It's quite a little bit of the room is still in there. And um, it uh, feels a little bit what I would call, this is called boxy. So it feels like an empty cardboard box is the kind of best way that I can describe what boxy actually means, what it means to me. It just feels loose. So um, there is a, often people think that that feeling in a sound, particularly in a kick drum, is a compression thing and it's partially it is but it's actually largely a frequency thing so if we go back into the uh let's say our keynote and we've got this thing right and we go into drums oh it doesn't actually really have it in this in this example um it can tell you the mixing with mix engineer handbook has this in it so it is the the area of this boxiness is around kind of 400 hertz so if i um let me do this i'll just do it again for i'm going to go for one of my favorite 
EQs, which I really like, is the Waves RTA. Let's hear it. Um, okay. So now I'm going to go at about 400 hertz. Can you hear the difference there? Okay, so take it off. So that's like the boxy area. So I've taken out, I knew that I could kind of hear that in the sound and then I decided to take it out. Okay, so that is the boxy zone. Okay. Any questions around that or anything that's unclear, let me know. Okay, so let's go, let's go back into the keynote for a sec. Where are we? So okay, so before we go to the next bit, the idea that I'm what I'm what I'm trying to um, put out in this first section is to really take um, don't just stab in the dark. A lot of people do. Um, so okay, a lot of people do sweeping where they you know put up the notch filter and they all the way around. I'm not like like majorly against sweeping, but I would say sweep with caution, right? If you, because, okay, this is the problem. If you sweep and you're not kind of, your ears are not developed enough or you do it for too long, you've forgotten the sound that you were actually listening to in the first place and the sweep is happening and that's kind of attracting your ears and then you just, you're like, oh, what was I doing? Or you hear something else and you pull that out. So I think that um, I, what I would say about sweeping is, Please don't do it unless you have an idea of a frequency in mind. You've got the sound, you've ad the adjective for what you want to enhance or what you want to remove. You've got, you think it's too muddy, it's too boomy, it's, it's not full enough, it's I want it to be area. You have those like, words and ideas. You match that with a frequency number that you think is appropriate based on you practicing and learning and making notes and all that kind of shit. Then you go to the, that, you boost it, and then you can do a little sweep around to try and find exactly the sweet spot that you heard in your head, right? That's cool. But like just aimlessly sweeping around, I really don't think it's going to help you be a better uh, EQ or a better mixer, okay? So that's a really hot tip from me. I really, really think that's a super important one. All right? Okay. Now, <laughs> I can go back small now. Um, and let's get back to it. Cool. So next thing is how do you use EQ in mixing? So we've got the kind of like the basic of how to actually use an EQ unit, but let's think, it, let's go, let's pull out a bit and let's think, um, zoom out to thinking about the whole mix project. So what are the different ways? Now, this is a question. I'm throwing it out to you all there. What are the ways that you actually use EQ in mixing? Maybe it's too obvious, but go for obvious. I'm fine for obvious. See if there's any answers to their answers coming in. In disguise, you like the sweeping advice? Yes. Thanks, mate. Nice one. So I guess that the the delay is a little bit, It's it, maybe it's a little bit more today for some reason. Um, well, I guess I'm just going to give you the answers. <laughs> you could, you could put, put them in. Maybe you've already put them in, but I can't see them. Okay. So moving back into it, um, yes, it's this obvious. You cut, you boost, or you balance. Now, the, the idea, okay, so from, from our, moving beyond that, the idea is, okay, cut what? Okay, so we're cutting things, obviously, that we want to remove. Okay, so that makes sense. But I would also like to you to think about the idea that maybe, okay, so people tend to boost a lot when they first start mixing. And when we're boosting, 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 we're kind of, we're not, what we're doing is running out of space because we're just pushing everything and it ends up, we're going to create noise and we're going to create a really messy, muddy, you know, mix that has no clarity or separation. So often if you're thinking about boosting, you might, and it's, all, it's also totally appropriate to boost, but not always. So sometimes rather than going, there's not enough of this, maybe think, is, does it feel like there's not enough of this because there's too much of that? Okay, let me give you a specific. Oftentimes people say there's not enough bass. <laughs> um, there's a few reasons why, but one of them is that there might be too much of the, of the upper information. So you see how I could, just before I cut out quite a lot of 400 hertz, that helped the bass frequency to kind of be more clear. Okay, so sometimes cutting um, is a better option than boosting straight away. Um, so generally we boost when you hear something 
that you love in the sound that you want to enhance and you want to bring out. Okay. So my, and then we balance and balancing is relating to frequency masking as well. So when we balance EQ, um, two or more sounds that we want to kind of fit together, um, in and around the similar kind of frequency band. So further to that, now this is kind of a note, this is what I do. When I cut, I tend to use more transparent EQs and cutting tends to make things kind of feel tighter, kind of cleans up and tightens the sound. When I'm boosting, um, I tend to use what I call character EQs, um, which uh, I'll talk about also further, but just to say analog emulations and things that have a style and a character that add a vibe to the sound rather than not doing anything, right? These tend to be kind of wider and more kind of diffuse the sound a little bit more. And then when I'm balancing, well, uh, I got both. I'm going to say I do both when I balance. Okay. Um, now, um, let me give you an example. If we go to uh, a demo, let me, I'm going to, um, maybe I'll, what I'll do is the kick drum. That could be a good one. Oh, okay, Pro Tools live here. Okay, so let's see. Now, if I turn all of these off, I'm not going to do them all from scratch because I'm, we don't really have the time to do this, but excuse me, I'm just going to talk about the um, the EQ on all of the kicks. So let's solo them. Put my groups back on and uh, here we go. Take the groups off and let's see what we've got. So there's just the out, this is the in, the kick in, and then this is this like a sub sample which have got some gritty kind of stuff into it. Okay, so when they all come in together, I can't really hear, for example, the sub of this gets lost, so let's put them in. So. I have to have a plan. So basically I've decided that my kick in, I want to just be high. So I'm going to, this is what I've done to it. I've taken out all the lows and I've also filtered off some of the top end because it was a little bit too much. Um, let's have a listen to that. So really just the click part is coming in. Okay. Then I have, okay. So now what I'm going to do this one, oh, turn it on. Let's check it out. Sorry, I keep on forgetting to loop this. Okay, so what have I done there? If anyone said took out the boxiness, you would be right. Now I'm going to talk about this notch in a minute. Let's check out the kick, the other kick, sorry. Let me do that. Hang on. So my other window. And let's put this in. Okay, so now you can see both of them are working together. If I take this off, there's some frequency masking. Okay, so let me explain what I'm doing here. I have particularly with these two. The other one I've just taken out all of the low end, but with these I've had to think about how I want to balance these in in around between 50 and 100 hertz. I'm just going to change this around a little bit. Um, okay, so they're kind of next to each other or on top of each other. So I've decided that I want my um, the kick out, which is on the bottom. The kick out is I'm going to lose the sub information from that because I've got a really subby kick sample that I want to come through okay so I have cut out up until 60 hertz 58.8 hertz there okay then on this one I have got a slight roll off at 30 hertz um but because that just tends to clean up the low end um it's barely audible but then I've actually boosted 55 in this area because I want to bring out that subtone in this kick sample more so if I now because I've boost of 55, I really have to make sure that I take out the sub frequency in this other, um, in the other kick. And I've made it a 24 dB per octave. So it's a really uh, strong, uh, 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 what do you call it? It's, 
uh, it will remove most of the frequencies that's, be, that's beyond it. So it's a steep curve is what I was looking for. Um, so now that is letting that through, and but I still want the kick out to have a have a bassy quality to it. So what I have done is I've boosted around a hundred hertz. So this this is like the first overtone of the kick harmonic. So a 40, uh, 48 or something is the kick in the sub kick, and then I've boosted its double frequency. So the first overtone in the kick out. So thereby they're working together. Does that make sense? Um, and then for both of them, I've kind of, I've cut kind of around that area. But you notice here, I've also cut around 100 where I've boosted in the kick out has been cut in in the um, in the sub kick. Okay, so it's like we're kind of melding them together like this, so that they are both going to have space in that free, uh, base frequency range, the so sub frequency range, because it's there's so much energy down there. There's we can only have space for one sound in kind of each of the frequency bands. I hope that that makes sense. Let me know if this is helpful or not. Okay, so that is an example of balancing. Um, okay, let me. I've got a question here from Etienne. Let's check it out. Etienne says, "Do you tend to EQ for all instruments and then compression when needed for all instruments, or EQ then compression one instrument at a time?" This is a really good question. Um, uh, the answer is I do all of it at the same time. So in, it's a difficult one because in the context of education and me trying to be clear about processes, I, I separate them. But when what I started, even you could hear when I started to talk about the kicks just then, um, I started to talk about the, I could have started, I almost started to talk about the kick envelopes and thinking about the energy and the dynamic range and because you hear it all at the same time. So um, the answer is, for me, I hear it all at the same time and I apply it at the same time. So I, as soon as I hear something, I work on it. Um, and for me, I kind of hear it all at the same time. So I think that. Uh, what I would suggest for you to give you some, um, you know, practical ways to kind of move forward with it. If you, uh, I would suggest work on one sound at a time when you're building up the arrangement. So let's say with this track, we're starting from the drums. I'm building up from the kick. Um, get work sound sound by sound and do, you know, the EQ and compression for each of the sounds and also in relation to each other. Um, rather than compressing everything and then EQing everything. It doesn't, it, it's all, like, you want to get the sound right, like, I think is the most important thing, right? Um, cool. Okay, hopefully that's answered it. Let me know. Um, so Travis is asking about envelope question mark. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to run with this. And we're thinking about the envelope of the kick drum. Absolutely. Um, and this is a good one to think about kind of routing and the way that I've approached this. So let, let's, um, I'm going to start talking about compression. We're almost, we're almost moving on to compression in a second, but I'm going to kind of segue it a little bit here by talking about everything that I've done to the kicks. So as I've got three kicks, I'm making life hard for myself. I should <laughs> having three kicks is kind of annoying. I should just have one or two maybe. But anyway, okay. So with this, with these sounds, um, and I'm going to come back to this later. I some often people just go in and compress straight away, but I often find that smart EQ is very powerful to really focus your sound, and also other dynamic processing like gating, particularly with. Um, percussion sounds and particularly with acoustic percussion sounds um so i have you see here uh, yeah you can see that um actually let me take off etienne's question so we don't get confused okay so i have um first of all i mean my trim's there from last week right so we can ignore that so i have first of up with my kick out i have a gate Okay, so let's have a listen to that. Then I have the EQ, and then I have a compressor. This F6 RTA is what I just did as an example, so I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, so let's play this, and I'll give you, we can check it out. Oh, this mouse is killing me today. Okay, so you can see the difference there. Take everything off much looser. I haven't even put the compressor on yet, okay? 
no compression. No compression. Okay? So I still want to compress though because, you know, it is 2020. <laughs> and anyway, but so when I compress though, when I've done these other things first, the compressor doesn't have to, the compressor doesn't need to work so hard and it can just really help to add that extra tightness and impact. Um, and the same goes with the other. I gated the other acoustic drum. And then something else I did was a bit advanced here with the sub. I used a transient shaper because the envelope, I didn't like it. It had some artifacts that were not working for me. So let me play that for you. Uh, turn that one off. Okay, without it. subtle you say and I say yes it was subtle it is subtle but it's there I heard it I promise <laughs> so okay so then the final thing is that and coming back to routing is that at some point I want these I don't want them to be working independently because that's going to make my mix kind of messy so then I finally I routed them all into one kick sub channel here and then I'm going to EQ them and add a little bit uh, sorry first of all I want to compress them together and then I'm adding a little bit of EQ. Now, one final thing to say is that I EQ'd the kick, oh, sorry, ah, I compressed the kick out as like I double compressed it because I felt it was really loose and we have this kick sub sample that was really strong and then I'm going to compress them again. Okay, so um, let's check that out. Hello, what's happening here? Try again, sorry. Okay. okay, now let's put the e compression on. And let's put the EQ on. A bit more sub frequency. Some of you can hear that, some of you won't be able to, but I pushed. Now, let's have a look at what I did here. Now, this is one of my most favorite EQs. I also used it before with my, uh, in another iteration as uh, with the Pro Tools one, but this is a UAD version, which is probably the best, I would say, uh, emulation. So the Pultec EQ, is anyone, does anyone use this? Now, let me just do an informal uh, question. What are your favorite EQs? Before we move on to compression, what are your go-to EQs? What's your favorite? So I'm a really big fan of the Neve 1081. I love it. Um, I really like the way that it's low and high pass filters work. I think they're really, they're just uh, very musical. The, this, uh, the Pultec EQPA is, um, you know, obviously legendary. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit why it's so cool in a second. Some of you will know, some of you might not. Um, <laughs> I'm just checking out Etienne. If it's, if it's not red, it's not compressed. Uh, you're going to make me upset there now. No red lining. <laughs> Um, anyway, okay, so uh, where are we? Um, oh, Ollie's into Neve, yeah, nice one. And pr yeah, Fab Filter, Fab Filter are great, really, really good. Um, Fab Filter are kind of like a, I would call them clean. They're very clean and transparent. So you need, you know, multiple EQs in your arsenal, I would say. So um, check it out. Oh yeah, Anna's just reminded me. There's a giveaway of the Brainworks BX Console Focusrite SC plugin. Don't forget it. Yes. And no one's saying the SL, SSLG EQ, also brilliant EQ. Yep. Okay. So the, the, this Pultec has, does this magic thing where it boosts and it attenuates at the same frequency band. What? How is that possible? Well, it's possible. Um, this is an advanced tip that I'm going to give you later. It relates to phase and phase cancellation um, with uh, filter types, but you, this is, we don't have time for that for, for today's webinar, but you can check it out. But this really, uh, it works really well because it kind of boosts uh, the low end, but then you attenuate it slightly and it tightens it up a bit. So let's have a little listen to that. Okay, let's take it out. I'm going to bring it in. Yeah. And tighten it up. Magic. Hope you heard that. That was, that's cool. So anyway, I really like this for particular things like kick drums. I really, I really, really like this on kick drums. 
Okay. So let's check, let's check back in on the keynote. And um, we really got to move past EQ because I've spent way too long on it. Um, but I think it's super important. Um, uh, you know, it's arguably the most important thing, I think. Okay, so quick fire tips. Number one, be aware of frequency masking. I've already kind of told you about it. Um, let's go here. So frequency masking, this can be this is the cause of lots of bad mixes that I see. Um, there are plugins that can help you with this. Isotope um, have released um, plugins. I don't know exactly what they are, but they're there. I would use it with, I always think that having the knowledge in your head is better than letting a computer do it, but I'm old school. How do you do it yourself? Pay attention and listen. And when you put turn a track on or you solo it and you put it back on, does it change the sound? If so, where? Are you losing frequency? If you're losing frequency um, of the timbre of a sound, it means there's frequency masking going on. So check it out. Um, tip two, different EQ flavors. And I've already been talking about this today. So I'm using Pultex, I'm using SSL, uh, G, G series, I'm using Fab Filter sometimes, I'm using the uh, F6 RTA, different EQs for different things. Now, the reason that this is something that I'm saying, I don't know how other people have said this, but particularly with analog emulations, let's say the Neve 1081 from UAD. If I use 20 iterations of the Neve 1081 by UAD, that's 20 exact uh, replicas of one unit um, with exactly the same frequency uh, contour in terms of its character that has been dialed in. So that can create build up, right? Now you would not have this in an analog situation because there's no two analog units that are alike. But when you're in a digital environment, you have to be careful of that. So for me, I just make sure that I use different EQs. I like it. I, I'm a plug-in kind of addict anyway. So, so I use all different ones. Okay. So yes, that's your tip. Tip three, arrangement and EQ. Um, be aware that sometimes, particularly if you're working on sounds and the EQ and you can't get it right, it might be a problem in the arrangement. And um, I'm just going to move through quickly with this, but there are different, you might not just be EQ. Try muting the track. Maybe it doesn't need to be there. Think about using the volume faders as well. Obviously EQ it. Consider repitching potentially. There's lots of different apps that can help you take it up or down to give it a bit of space, or if those things don't work, then it's time to go back into the production and ask the producer or do it yourself and fix it. All right, fourth one is phase and EQ. Now, I'm not going to talk about this now. I kind of just mentioned it. It's advanced. Maybe we can do it in the future. Um, but we have linear phase EQs and minimum phase EQs, transparent EQs, you want to be linear phase and minimum phase that add character and, you know, kind of sometimes do unexpected things would be a minimum phase. The Pultec EQ is an example of a minimum phase. Um, here is a really great uh, YouTube video by FabFilter if you want to check it out. I'll put the link in the bio, uh, in the description. Um, and that's it for EQ. Now, I'm not going to do any more question times for EQ because I feel like we've had lots of questions and we've been talking about this for ages. So let's move on. Compression. So how does compression really work? How does it really work? Now, yeah, the, the, this, you ask yourself this question right now. If you were alone in an analog studio with your 1176 compressor set up right here, would you feel confident to use it without presets? Could you, get, could you get the bass sound sounding really good? Could you run a kick drum through it and make it sound really hit in the way that you want it to? Could you, uh, could you, could you set it up for vocals? Could you set it up for a drum subgroup? Okay, so if you can't do that, then you know that you need to work and learn and read and practice compression more. And you don't need to have a physical unit. You can do it in the box, but just make sure you don't use presets and don't trick yourself. So what does compression do? I'm, again, I'm not going to get into this. This is from a video by Isotope. It's really good, but we're obviously reducing the gain. Okay, we're, so we're reducing the dynamic range and that brings the gain down generally and we will bring it up at the end of the day, right? So these, again, questions for you, I'm not going to answer them um, in too much detail, but you need to know the answers to these. And I'm going to assume that you know the answers to at least some of these things, like what does ratio do? Reduces anything over the threshold by the amount of the ratio. So 4 to 1, 4 dB, down to 1 dB, et cetera, okay? 
threshold is the point at which gain reduction will occur. The attack is the, this is actually, I've got a picture of the attack. This is really good, I think. This comes from a really good blog post on Lander. It's called How to Use a Compressor. That's a really good demonstration, I think, about what attack and release does. Because I think people get confused about that. Um, this is a good one, I think. What is considered small, medium, heavy compression? Let, let's make that an interactive question. What do you think? Let's go, what do you think heavy compression is? At what point? How many dB gain reduction? Okay, so then another question is what is knee? I'm not going to answer that. If you don't know, get one of the books and check it out. Um, also, the different types of compressor circuits. So there's a bunch of different types of compressors, and they might do the job better or worse depending on the circumstance. Like an FET compu uh, computer compressor is good for uh, for drums and for transient stuff and fast things like rap vocals maybe, whereas a optical compressor is going to be better for like a Frank Sinatra type ballad or um, you know pads or something like that. Okay. Um, so knowing those things is also going to help you compress better. And then a little trick question there, does compression make a sound louder or softer? That, I'll leave that as a rhetorical question for you. <laughs> so let's see if we've got any answers to what, throw me your answers in there. Um, uh, I've got a question from Noan saying, do you use the new routing folders in Pro Tools. Someone asked that last week. I'll put that up. Um, no, no, and I don't. I'm old school. And I also, because I mix analog, I would tend, um, it's, yeah, it's not my thing. But I've heard that they're great. So if you're into it, go for it. Okay, so we've got some answers here. No one says 6 dB in disguise says anything over 10 dB. is considered. Now the question is what's heavy gain reduction? Johan is saying 4 dB. Etienne is saying around 10 dB. Okay, so that's quite a range of answers there. The This is a general gist of it. 1 to 2 dB is is small amount of compression. Uh, 3 or 4 dB is like a medium amount of compression, and anything over, like let's say 5 or 6 dB, would be considered a lot of compression. Okay, so those of you who are saying 10 that's a significant, that's serious, right? That's a lot of compression. So why do we care about that? Is like, if you're going to be compressing 10 dB, you better have a really good reason for it. And also be careful that you're not driving the compressor too hard and you're creating artifacts that are not nice in the sound. You can do it if it sounds good, like knock yourself out, but make sure you're careful about it. Okay. All right. So let's go back. We've done our pop quiz now. You're all straight to the top of the class. So then the next question is, okay, how do we use, like, so, you know, what are some of the common approaches to using a compressor? So I've kind of suggested a few of them already. So, um, you know, kick drum, vocal ballad, a bass guitar, backing vocals, or a mix bus. So you should start to learn the stand, like these are standard approaches to it. And again, this is an art, right? Mixing is an art. So you can do whatever you want, but in terms of learning, it's, you know, if you want to get some, 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 some confidence with where you're going, start by learning the standard approaches and then you can start to experiment and find your own kind of flow within it. Um, so here are some standard. So we've got a kick drum. Standard thing would be to use an FET compressor uh, with a mid to slow attack and with a fast-ish kind of release. I would want a medium reduction, so I'm going to go for that 4 dB or something like that, and I would tend to start off with a 4 to 1 ratio. Okay, the, all of these things you can find in books, right? I'm just going to go quickly through a couple of these. So vocal ballad, I'm going to go for an optical compressor. The characteristics of an optical compressor is that they're slower, um, they also colour the sound more, they kind of have warmth and a shimmer to the sound. Um, they have notoriously slow attack and release. Um, and I'd sit at a four to one ratio if I could select it. A lot of optical compressors have the ratio kind of built in, which I think is generally set standard to four to one. And I'd again want kind of a medium amount of gain reduction. Then we've got a bass guitar. This I'd kind of do things a bit different. I might go for a higher ratio 
And I might push it a little bit harder because bass guitars can be quite loose uh, instruments and we want to get them feeling percussive and feeling controlled. So um, that's the reason I'm going to go harder on that. Um, then we have subgroups and mix bus. So interesting to mix bus compression. Do you know how to set up your mix bus compressor? It's a pretty standard way. There's not really many ways to work with a mix bus compressor. It's generally VCA. You want a slow attack and a fast release so that you're not messing with the transient and the energetic aspect of the music. It's kind of tightening the groove in the back end. You want light compression, light ratio, two to one, and a small amount of reduction, one to two dB. Now, this is important because compression, when you have multiple iterations of compression, like four to, you have compression on the kick drum, compression on the kick subgroup, compression on the drum subgroup, and then mix bus compression. So if you've got four to one plus four to one plus two to one plus two to one, is it a plus or is it a times? So maybe I'm being confusing here. But if you add up the ratios of multiple stages of compression, it's actually multiplied. Okay. So it's not two, it's not four plus four plus two plus two. It's four times four times two times two. Okay. So that's the the idea about the the significance of the ratios that you're going to be getting. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, so let's go in and have a go at setting up one of these one of these uh, one of these compressors. All right, what have we got here? Let's do. I haven't done the snares really yet in this mix, so let's do that. Okay, I need the chorus because we've got rim shot in the first bit. Where is it? Yeah, this bit here. I'm just going to focus on that for now. Okay. Now I'm going to... I'm going to mute the room mics because the ki the snare sounds amazing in the room. The room mics have been picked up. So I just want to focus in on the snare at the moment. So I've just got the kicks and the snares going. So Now, let's see. Now, I kind of, I kind of quite like that sound as it is, but let's, let's check it out. So I'm going to put some compression on. Oh, it really... It annoys me how I've actually got to change the settings here. So. Okay, so now I think this is too strong. It was too aggressive. Now it was because it was started to to squeeze on the sound, right? So um, I have eight to one compression, and uh, I have quite of a the attack is medium, but I think I'm going to make it slower even because it's still holding on to that transient a little bit too much. And the important thing is to gain stage because it was quieter on the way out than it was on the way in. So let's check that out. Oh, hang on, I'm back on the rim. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so you can see that. So now... Okay, so I ended up actually only wanting 2 dB on this on this snare, um, and I did do an 8 to 1 com uh, ratio, so it kind of, it, 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 it was kind of more intense, but for, um, at, the fr at the front part of the transient, I guess. Okay, so um, the, also the other thing that I wanted to talk about here is the release and how I want the release to work. So I want the release to work in a way that, Mo that it makes sense so also for me that the needle is moving kind of with the music let's check that out again Doo -doo. cool okay so i felt like the release was a little bit too fast it was like that Right, so if this was techno or something, fine for the re for the release to be moving more kind of do do do. But this is groove, right? The, my track is moving in this kind of way, so I want to go ba 
Okay, so I want the the kind of the 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 movement and the way that the compressor is going to be coming on and off the sound to be in this kind of feeling. I don't know how to explain it in another way than that, but hopefully that makes sense too. Okay, so the release for me is working with the groove and the energy and the vibe of the track. Let's see, I've got a question here, I think. Oh yeah, so Ollie is saying, let's check it out. This is a really good question. Um, what is your opinion on mixing the whole track into a bus compressor? Great question, Ollie. Really, really good one. Um, I'm a fan of bus compression. Um, I use it. Uh, I haven't set it up for today's session um, just to kind of not confuse things too much. But, yeah, I, I do use bus compression and I would set it up uh, probably now just before I start doing this kind of EQ stuff. So after from the first week's session last week when you do all the setup, after I've done that, before I get into this, uh, the audio processing, I'd set up my mix bus compressor, definitely. Um, and I use a, I'm really, I love the SSL mix bus compressor. I love all the versions of them, the real ones, the emulations. So I use that. And so that's a VCA compressor. And I, my, my settings are, I think I already showed them to you. And then not, there's nothing too exciting about it. It's really standard. So let me, where is it? There's my mix bus setting. So I use VCA, slow attack and fast release, um, two to one ratio and one to two dB of gain reduction. Now, since this question has been asked, why don't I actually just set it up? I'll just do my, my mix bus compressor now because lots of people don't understand mix bus compression or they feel scared by it or something. I don't know. Okay, so here's my master. Now I'm going to put my VU meter. I'm going to change my VU meter so it's after my mix bus compressor. Um, where is it? I'll just do the search. Oh, hang on. So SSL. You can see that I've got all the versions of everything SSL ever made, but I actually want to use the UAD one um, today. Where is it? Oh, hang on. Okay, hang on a sec. It's called. Oh, it would have been faster for me just to ch just find it. I'm just going to do it this way. It's a problem when you have a a plug-in addiction. <laughs> oh, the struggle is real. Okay. Um, where is it? Have I passed it yet? No. Here it is. Yes. Okay. What is nice PRS, by the way? What does that mean? Arna? <laughs> okay, here we go. Mix bus compression setting up. Okay. So I want my attack to be slow and I want my release to be fast. The ratio is two to one is what I want. And now I'm going to bring back the threshold just a little bit to make sure it's going to work a little bit more. So that feels good to me. Um, however, it feels a little bit like it's holding on to the low end a bit. Um, the, um, the, the guitar. Oh, okay. So it's obviously someone else. Nice one. Oh yeah. Ollie's guitar. Is it? Okay. Got it. Um, so, okay. So it feels as though the compressor is kind of working a bit too hard on the low frequencies and I don't necessarily want the compressor to even do anything. I just want it to let them through. So um, it has this uh, a filter. So I'm going to let go. So that's saying let everything below this point, which is about 60 Hertz, go through and not be compressed. And the rest is going to be compressed and then it's going to rejoin at the end. And let's see what it sounds like now. You can see that the compressor is not working quite as hard. And that's the vibe. So and then I'm going to bring this down a little bit more. Cool. Okay. So that's how I set up my mix bus compressor and I leave it there. Now, one of the things with mix, mix bus compression that you have to be really careful of is if you don't, if you're not good with um, 
uh, gain staging and maintaining unity, you're going to come back to your mixed bus compressor and it's going to be going wild and you're going to be re um, reducing much more than the 1 to 2 dB that you want to, right? So if you're going to use a mixed bus compressor, you have to have good workflow, good gain stage and all that kind of stuff. So be careful of that. Um, and um, it will help you be more realistic about where you're at. And also, if you're using your VU meter, you can see here, let me check in on that again. Hang on, this might be. Come on. No. Yeah, beautiful. Oof, I love it when it hits dancing around that zero point, beautiful stuff. Okay, so um, the mix bus compressor helps to kind of just control that a little bit. Um, so Ollie has one more question, which is a good one that I want to look at. And would you take that off before the master or would you print it? Sometimes that's something you've been confused by. Totally. This is another really, really good question. So um, now it depends if you're doing it well or not is the, is the answer. So if you're doing, like I set it up and you've got a little bit of game reduction, it's just gentle and you're doing two to one ratio, you're not kind of going mental. And really the mixed bus compressor, in my opinion, should be pretty transparent. Like you shouldn't really hear much. It should just feel a little bit like you're kind of tightening things. If it really changes the sound of your mix, it's not a mixed bus compression really then in the sense of the glue idea of what the SSL compressor was kind of designed for. So in that case, your mastering engineer might ask you to take it off because they think that, you know, you've kind of not done a good job with compression. So the answer is if you do it right and if you know what you're doing and if you're good with a compressor, you always, I would all, I would never not have mix plus compression on. It's part of my creative flow and it's part of my mix. If I take it off, it changes my mix, right? So the answer to the question is, you know, ideally you leave the mix bus compression on. That's the last thing that you have. Maybe you have a little bit of EQ if you wanted to add a bit of sparkle, but um, those are the two things. You wouldn't have much on your mix bus. Um, any limiting that needs to be gone, absolutely. No limiting at all um, when you're going to be sending it off to your mix engineer. Okay, hopefully that answered the question. Um, I noticed that we're going over time here and I haven't talked about spatial and dimension processing. I'm going to talk about it in the context of vocal and production next week. Um, so let's see where we're at with regards to compression. Okay, so we've kind of looked at how to apply compression and we've also looked at the different uses of compression. So it's not just one way of controlling dynamic. We're thinking about the movement of the sound while thinking about the release. We're also thinking about gluing multiple sounds together in the way that we use a compressor on a subgroup for multiple tracks, either how I combine my kicks or also um, with what I just showed you about mixed bus compression. So really different approaches and ways that we're using compression. Um, there's, there's also other ones like, the, you know, the famous all button in mode or British mode, which actually the compressor starts to be timbral and it really starts to change the kind of frequency uh, re response. Um, and it really plays with the envelope contour. So there's, you know, there's other ways as well to use a compressor. Um, so again, you know, the, the idea for me is think, always thinking about, thinking about what you want to do, how you want to use the compressor, not just going to a compressor in a one-shop stop a kind of approach okay and also thinking about the different types of compressors you know vca fet optical this you know kind of a fab filter type compressor that's very transparent or whatever okay so now final thing tips for compression tip number one as i've already said some of these i've already said so i'm going to bring them out again tip number one sometimes gating and eq and more what you need before you compress. So a lot of people dive in straight away with compression and it's not always the right answer, okay? So um, you, hopefully you heard when I did the, the kick drum today, when I gated it and EQ'd it before I compressed it, it really tightened up that sound in a, in a great way. So sometimes that's the answer, particularly I would say with acoustic instruments, okay? So keep that in mind. Tip number two, um, consider transients, okay? So do you want... And when, in, what I mean by that is, so the transient is the thing that kind of catches our attention, even though we don't necessarily like kind of 
acknowledge it or hear it. We kind of feel it in a way. It's it's a difficult thing for me to describe. But so do you want with transience, the way that I try and think about it is do I want the sound to catch the attention or do I want it to kind of blend and be kind of more felt and more kind of emotional or whatever? And which part of the sound is more important? And so the transients need to come through so it hits the listener first, right? So an answer to that, um, okay, with my kick drums that I had, I had three different kicks and they all have a strong transient. And I had to decide I didn't want all three of the kick transients coming through. They kind of had slightly different attacks as well. So I wanted to prioritize it. And one of my kick uh, compressors, I had a really fast attack. So it was really clamping down on the transient. So really just think about the transients um, in terms of their role for grabbing attention um, in the mix. Hopefully that makes sense for you. Another good one is lead vocals and backing vocals. So on lead vocals, I want to have a slower attack because I want to let the lead vocal come through. But with backing vocals, I don't want them to compete with the lead vocal. I want them to complement the lead vocal. So I'm more likely to have a faster attack so that I control those transients so they don't get in the way and kind of make get things messy. So a good question, if you're kind of going, oh, I don't know, I can't hear it, um, something that I think is, a go is good. Again, always think mixing is all really about how you feel. So if you feel like irritated at all or you feel like, I don't know, like distracted, that's probably that you've got a lot of transients like at your head at the same time. So think about that, okay? Which of the sound do you want to be up and front and taking your attention and those that you don't want there, make sure you've gotten rid of that strong transient if it's there. Does that help? Hopefully. Okay, tip number three. Um, this is a very important one as well. Stages of compression often work better than one super aggressive unit or one super aggressive unit. You get what I'm saying, hopefully. So rather than doing massive compression, like again, lots of people when they first start mixing, they have this hardcore compression limiting on the master and uh, it does not really successful for good mixing. So w often what you'll find is that, you know, you might have a little bit of compression here on the snare drum you add a, a bit more compression on the drum group, then you have um, the mix bus compression as well. So these different stages and we're adding it up and we're using it, um, you know, gently rather than just going, going like hell for leather. Tends to be the way that works best, right? Um, yeah. And then the final one, which I've already said, is think of the release in the way that you imagine a human reacting to it. This is what I do. So like I mix lots of different genres. So if I'm mixing techno, my release, I want it to be like boof, 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 right? If I'm mixing house, it's going to be like boom, boom, boom. It's going to be like kind of a little bit more dancey. Funk, as I was explaining to you before, with this track has got more funk. I want it to be like this kind of groove is a bit more this kind of way. So yeah. Does that make sense? The needle on the compressor, I always think about how that's moving relating to what the track and the intention of, of the song is. And the tip number five is really important is to make sure you maintain unity, okay? So um, particularly if you're using mix plus compression, but all the time, turn the unit on, turn the unit off, check that it sounds, that you haven't made it sound louder or softer either. Um, and also, you know, the, the other thing to that, to turn on and off, does it sound good? Have you made it sound better? If you're in doubt, it probably means no. So don't do audio processing just for the sake of it. Okay. So where are we at? Let's check in on some questions. No more questions there. Few secs. Yo, everyone. So yeah, that was, uh, so we, I, I missed out on the spatial and dimension aspects of it, but I kind of wasn't sure if we'd get time for it all because, you know, talking about EQ and compression, they're super important. Um, they are, you know, the really the foundation of mixing. Um, if you get these right, then, you know, you can kind of be really playful with spatial and dimension stuff. I will bring in the spatial and dimension stuff into our final webinar next week when I'm talking about vocal production and stuff. Um, vocal production, vocal mixing, vocal arrangement a little bit. Um, so now's your last chance for questions, questions about EQ and compression. Um, hopefully I've answered most of them. 
Are you out there still? Give me a shout out. Give me a, what are you doing now after the webinar? Where are you heading to? Um, it's a pretty nice day in Berlin. I don't know what it's like in the UK, those of you that are around. So we'll hold on for a few more, few more secs and then we will, we'll finish up. Doesn't seem like we've got any more questions. Let's see. I'm just going to play the track for a little bit while we have have a bit of mood music whilst we're waiting. Give you a few, few minutes left. Also, also feel free to ask me things you want to talk about next week. Also fine. Okay, so we have we have a few a few final from my loyal, lovely students there, Etienne and Nokine. Thanks, y'all. Um, uh, oh, Colm's coming to town. Nice. Um, so hang on, I do have a few questions. Uh, so Etienne says, yeah. So does it sound better? If in doubt, probably no. Well, yeah. I mean, if you don't know if it makes something better or not. Um, don't do it like it either does or it doesn't right that's the thing you can either hear if it does and if it doesn't do something else um there is one more question here though from etienne um do you sometimes you use a compressor followed by another compressor rather than only one compressor with a more aggressive setting absolutely absolutely so that's what i was just saying before is that um often time I mean you know look there's always there's always times where you could do all of it it's an art right you can the rules are there ain't no no ain't, ain't no rules um but I think that in terms of with with a compressor there's if you overdrive the compressor you can bring in uh unpleasant artifacts and you can start to certain parts of the sound will be um uh, over compress it'll start to sound flat and things like that so there's definitely an optimal level of the compressor and if you push past that it's not going to sound great so um, but you might want to control the sound in different ways like something that's really popular in vocal mixing I'm going to do it next week is uh, using a faster compressor like 1176 type thing um, in at the beginning of this chain and at the end using like an optical compressor with a with a you know, less amount of gain reduction. So this kind of double compression trick is quite popular in pop music, for example. Um, so Johan, I was at the same question that Etienne was asking. Um, I guess so. Okay. So hopefully I answered that question for you. All right, everyone. Um, I'm going to leave it there. The question come through. Thank you very much for, for listening and being part of the session. And uh, I hope it was good for you. We've got, we got really geeky. We got really into EQ and compression. And um, it, please, I hope it's going to help you in your mixing and uh, all the best of luck with it. Next week, uh, number three mixing webinar. Oh, sorry, mixing webinar. We're going to go talk about production a little bit as well. Um, and uh, that will wrap it up for our series. Okay. so. Thanks, everyone, for being here today and get out and enjoy the sunset wherever you are. And I'll see you next week. Ciao. Oh, no one's, hang on, before I, no one says maybe parallel compression I'd like to talk about next week real quick. Cool. We're going to do it. I'll put it in my list. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Ciao.